I guess first, good morning. Good to see you guys here. I, I know we have a few people away, it looks like. Uh, it's a little empty here. And I see no one's in the front here, so yeah, that's all right. Um, but yeah, no, Pastor Clint is away this week, so I'll be speaking this morning. And we have Tim uh, preaching next week as well. So uh, yeah, so Clint is just away uh, helping some of his family. Well, his in laws move, so that is why he's away. Um, but yeah, no, this morning we're. Still continuing in our series in John, um, but we're just going to be going back a uh, couple chapters where initially I was going to be speaking a little bit early, so we just moved it around. So we're going to be in chapter 6, uh, talking about how the event when Jesus is feeding the 5,000. Um, and we're going to say this morning we're going to take some time to look at how, say, we can find hope in who Jesus is and, so how, and how he is more than enough for all humanity and say how our faith can grow as we just continue to run to him. Um, but, yeah, so since it's been a little bit since we were, we were a couple chapters uh, further last week, so just some background before we get going again uh, from where Clint le left off. Say so today we're looking at an event where, say, there's going to be, say, John records where Jesus and his disciples are on, say, this mountainside, and this large crowd has been, is coming towards them, and... In, with the setting, uh, this is following from what John records uh, right after the healing of the paralyzed man at the pool of Bethesda. Um, that's back when they're in Jerusalem. But then John kind of says that there's some time has passed, and now they're here, uh, which I'll get into. Um, but each of the four Gospels I find is interesting when I was looking at this passage is that a lot of the Gospel, well, the different Gospel writers, they included different events. They didn't all include the exact same themes throughout uh, their accounts. And just this one in particular, though, with the Fiend the 5,000, is in all four, which I found was just interesting when, say, of course, the climax with his death and resurrection, that's in all of them, of course. But even stuff with the nativity, though, that's only in, say, like Matthew and Luke. So I just that was interesting when I was looking at this passage this weekend. Um, but a couple of things beyond what we get from John's, like, because we know from John, say, that some, some time has passed between when they're in Jerusalem and this healing happened, um, and we know, say, they're on this mountainside, and that they're now kind of in Galilee. Uh, but when we look at the other gospel writers, they kind of give a few more details, they kind of give a wider perspective, like, say, like Luke and Mark kind of, we f kind of give, we get the understanding that they're close to at least this town of Beth Bethsaida, um, in Galilee, as they crossed, of course, the Sea of Galilee. Um, and from Matthew, though, he gives a little bit more um, info. Like, each of the writers have a little bit different stuff right before um, this event. Say, like, initially, say, with Matthew, we see that the death of John the Baptist has just happened. So Jesus still is a, in that time of mourning. Um, before this event, and but even though with this, as they're on the boat, he takes pity upon the people, and is healing, goes to the shore and heals their sick. So that's in his account of this of healing. But the other thing I think uh, with Matthew that I found is helpful. I guess it gives more a perspective to this passage. Is that say, uh, say he says the, me the men in this crowd numbered five thousand, but say this did not include all the women and children that were with them. So overall, like. This is a much more immense crowd than just the 5,000, so. And, see, so I guess we'll just jump into it from there. And so we're going to start, because initially we got the setting, so uh, we're going to start in verse 5 of chapter 6, uh, which today I didn't quite have time to get it for you, so you just have to flip through, but I'll read it out for you. Um, so I'll start. Verses uh, 5 to 6 to start, I'll say, where Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him. And he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for I already knew what he had in mind. Was, I already had in mind what he was going to do. So in this time we see the disciples are sitting with Jesus on this mountain side where, say, this great crowd is coming towards them uh, from the surrounding areas because they've seen these signs and these wonders that he's been performing. So this is drawing this mass crowd and... Then he kind of, just before, like, Jesus asks, is going to ask Philip, which we'll look at, like, uh, which, say, all the disciples are with him, but he's going to ask uh, Philip this question. Um, 
Like, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Like, where can they pay for this food for this immense crowd that has been following Jesus? And, but before, say, uh, we even go in, like, Philip's response, uh, Jesus, say, we, we see that he already knows the solution to how this need is be, going to be met. He already knows how it's going to be provided. And initially, like, we see that, say, Philip responds, or more he just reacts uh, to how this, more naturally how this question would be if you were to give, begin this question. Like, where in verse 7 it says, Peter answered him, how it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for every each one to have a bite. And as, say, we looked with Matthew's account, like, this crowd is said to be 5,000 men, but, say, that's not including, say, their families that also come along. So, really, this could be in the tens of thousands of this, this crowd that Jesus is asking these, his disciples and his followers just uh, how we're going to feed them. Um, and so Philip is like reacting quite naturally to such a request. And he's, but he's reacting more in this worldly understanding, like saying that, say, you're going to need, he's looking towards the money and how logically this would play in, like in a normal, in a worldly setting, I guess. Uh, like it would take half a year's wages to feed this giant crowd for just them to have a scrap of food, not that they'd be full, but just so they could even have a little bite. Um, but as they continue, say, then... Uh, Another disciple, Andrew, who's a brother, a brother of Peter, speaks up, where it says in verse 8, Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? So Andrew here, I say, has given some effort into finding a solution to meet this need that has arisen. But even though, say, he's found this boy with some loaves and fish, like Andrew is still struggling um, to see how this need can be met. Like, but the fact, though, he still chose to bring the boy to Jesus, so we still see he has that glimmer of faith. But it's still hard for him to hold on to. So he's probably st he's still questioning how the need will be met. A little differently, say, than Philip, but, but this need that has been uh, given to them by Jesus. So be again, before this happened, like, the disciples have been with Jesus for some time now. It's like they've been seeing him heal the sick and perform various miracles. Uh, over his time with him, like for instance, as I just mentioned earlier, like they just had that healing of that paralyzed man uh, by the pool of Bethesda, which that's in John 5, verse 5, where we know like from that that he's been paralyzed for 38 years, but in a sentence a, that the disciples kind of heard him say, just, just pick up your mat and walk, and he, is found, he finds freedom in that moment. And, and say, so even though Jesus has performed such as like wonders such as these before the disciples, as this is why I say this big crowd has been coming. They've been seeing him doing these signs, doing these wonders, and that's why it has drawn them. But here we say we do see say Philip and Andrew. They're still struggling to not look at this crowd with perspective of what they can achieve in their own strength, rather than holding on to their faith in Jesus. See, because Philip goes towards the money being the solution to meet the need, say working for half a year to go to get this, and Andrew, it's like he finds this boy who has some food, but in Andrew's eyes, it's still hard for him to grasp how little can meet such a large need. And in his reaction and attempt say, to answer this question given to them by Jesus, say, we see their faith is challenged, where even though, say, they knew Jesus had been performing miracles uh, before their very eyes, again, in verse 2, uh, in the setting, we kind of see that this is why the crowd has been following him. But rather than give... Uh, in answer, Jesus just gets them to instead go and seat the people. Um, which in verse 10 says, Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass uh, at, in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. So even when, say, the, the, with the disciples' inability to clearly answer what they were able to do or offer, Jesus gets them to prepare the people to receive. As he already knows how this need is going to be met, And before we continue, though, just to bring this more to our context, like how many times do we find ourselves facing uh, like a question that we don't really have an answer to or something we don't know how it's going to be seen through? And uh, how easy is, is it for us to lose faith when we don't see how we can bring that resolution that's in front of us? Like, like maybe you haven't really faced that yet, or maybe, but I'm sure many of you have had those moments in your life. And, and had had to journey through harder seasons. 
Although, say, sometimes it's not too long, we say, before God provides in a way we don't expect, and it just feels like you're, say, on like a car ride, or you're not even in control, it just, you just kind of get to watch God just move in your life, and it's just unfolding before you, like, which with that, like, one instance uh, I was trying to think of for this, um, what happened earlier this year with me, like, uh, I had an instance where I went down to a friend's wedding uh, in January, and I was coming back, and Weatherport looked a little bit interesting, but I was like, oh, well, I've, I've driven lots in snow in both Alberta and BC, so I thought it'd be fine, and I left at a good time. But something out of my control happened where, say, Highway 1 got shut down for, say, a few hours. Uh, that made it a lot more delayed than my initial plans, so the roads were a lot icier by the time I was getting closer to home. And when I was about, say, I think it was one turn away even from my exit off the highway, my, say, my car hit some black ice and started spinning, at the end of the story, anyway, my car was ended up off the road um, in that moment. And, um, so I look, but when I look back, though, I can see a lot of God's provision in that, that I, even though it was my mistake and my problem, I just saw how God moved through that. Like, uh, well, the fact that, say, no on, because I ended up on the other side of the road, so there was no oncoming traffic at that moment, because so that, it was really icy, so no one really could stop in the time when I was spinning on the road. And the fact that as I hit, like, I walked away pretty much unscathed beyond a little bit of a bruised wrist, so that was a blessing. Um, and see, with the conditions in that night and the time it was where my mind was at, I didn't really, as I was new to the area, I didn't really know what exactly to do for contacting people, just where my head was, but it wasn't even five minutes after that, say that five, well, sorry, three cars stopped. And one in particular, say, they uh, came up to me, they offered me a ride and also helped me get the stuff I needed right out of my car and gave me a ride home. Like someone I didn't know and I haven't seen since that day. Um, but in that moment, say, God provided. And there's even things over that too with his provision, like I've seen kind of further with that, like how he, with the car I ended up getting, uh, both through his provision financially from others giving and. Um, which was more than I expected, and from, say, others lending me their car, so I had time to look. So there's many things, anyway, um, that I saw God move that were really, even though it was my mistake, I saw God move in my life. And So in sharing this, sometimes, say, we're faced with situations or seasons, and say, we don't have an answer or solution to, but we just have to trust God. Like, sometimes he does respond right away and doesn't really give us much time to think, say, with this, I had a few mo moments where so I was just sitting in my car, and then some people stopped, and so I didn't have time to worry about it too much. But, so sometimes he does act right away. But, but in those times, though, do we choose to trust God, though, still, knowing that he's the same God, say, that from like 2,000 years ago that died on the cross for our sins? And uh, do we still place our faith in him when we don't know or can't explain what we're facing? And do we know, say, that Jesus knows the plan? That, say, like as we continue, we're going to spend some time looking, though, at how Jesus will see what, like, what we have to offer is more than enough for him, which we'll go over now uh, 11 to 13 from chapter 6. Like Jesus took the loaves and gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. So in this passage, this is, say, Jesus bringing fulfillment to the question he already initially had asked Philip. Um, he mirrors them, say, how they are to respond, taking what was provided by the boy who came forward with Andrew, giving things, blessing it, and giving back what was provided to the Father. And following to say that the food is distributed to the crowd, uh, by the disciples, and say, and afterwards, say they recollect re what is left, and there ends up being twelve baskets um, from the initial loaves and fish that were blessed by Jesus. So we see, even amidst say the questioning and lack of faith shown by some of the disciples, Jesus demonstrates to them that through him, the little that was given was, which was all the boy, like all the food the boy had, that was more than enough. Say so it was not through the boys or the disciples' strength that this was accomplished, but through Jesus. Although we still see here that they had to be the hands and the feet. If, say, the boy did not choose to come forward and offer what he had, say so that food would not have been blessed and multiplied by Jesus. And, 
in the distribution of food, say the disciples still had to be the hands and feet and taking the bread that was provided to the people. But here, though, we, we're seeing, though, that say, Jesus is not limited by human ability and strength, that he still cares that the disciples, even though he can do no strength, he still cares that they um, are part of it, that they still distribute the bread. So our context, like when we look at this passage, there are times when we will perhaps feel like what we have given or, ca- or could give is not enough, not as good, or which there are many times I have felt like that for sure. And, but when we take from, what we can take from this is that even though, say, the bread and fish were provided by the boy, maybe in appearance uh, were lesser in, in the worldly eyes, like say maybe because it was made of barley, not wheat, and maybe they say it's small fish, not just fish. So even though it's limited quality, we are also seeing that it's, in appearances, it's limited. Well, sorry, it's not limited amount, but it's also in the quality. So it's both these things that, in the worldly perspective, that kind of are going against it. But, but these things do say, do not limit God. We see Jesus is not limited by what we bring, but he cares that we do take what we do have and bring it before him. And, and in doing this, say what we have to offer, even though it may seem insignificant uh, to ourselves, this can be used by Jesus to meet the need in which, in saying this passage, I'm sure is in a way that both this boy and the disciples could did not imagine at all. Um, it wasn't just that everyone was provided for, they were fully filled, it was that there's a bunch of food left over. So in Jesus, there will always be more than enough. And it's important reminded for us today that because even when we take time to look at who God has used and worked through over the Bible, uh, most of the time we see that these people had like many different struggles and mistakes. Um, they didn't always get it right, and God still moved and worked through, the, through them to achieve his purposes. Like the example I initially think of is with Moses from the Old Testament, where, see, he had a lot of things going in his life, a lot of flaws and a lot of mistakes, like, say, when he was younger, when he was still an adult, but he, he killed an Egyptian, and, and even in his initial calling, say, uh, at the burning bush, like he tried to reject that calling, but God worked through him in that and uh, mentored him through that and pastored him through that. And also with his ability to speak, like he, st- he struggled to speak, um, say, to, to the Israelites initially and then to Pharaoh and the Egyptians, but God still chose to use him. Um, and we see that, say, God does not need a perfect person uh, to do his will, but God does ask that we step out in faith and trust that the call and task that he does set before us he will help see us through that. Which again, say, bring this back to what I've been talking about with the boy, what the boy had to offer that was miraculously used to provide for this vast crowd. Like with our, when we look at the opportunities that we do have or the ways we can give from in this, we need to remember that it's less about the quality and the amount that we're able to give, but rather that we do give what we have to Jesus and trust that he's going to use it use it to further his purposes. Like it's not, I'm not saying not to try to do your best, but it's just saying that it's the fact that we do give what we have and not just say that's not enough um, because he can use it in his, in his strength that this happens. And, and as we kind of transition to the last part of the text, we also see that Jesus has not only come for one group, which we'll see that this crowd has misunderstood this as say he's come for all humanity, uh, which we see through this miracle too is, is, is like an image of that. Um, which I'll just read, verses 14 and 15, where it says, After the people saw the signs Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him his king, him king by force, withdrew again to the mountain by himself. So we, here we see that the crowd is misinterpreted, like who Jesus is, desiring that he would become their king and leader, and they see Jesus as the one who's come for them to lead them from the foreign rulers that are above them right now, as we know. During that time, say, the Roman kingdom under Caesar had control over the nation that, while wow, Jesus was with them. And Jesus, spoke, he sees their intent, and in his response, from what we can know of the, his time on earth, is, as Jesus withdrew from them, they, and they mis- misunderstood who he was and what these miracles meant. Um, also, to go back, like, say, Jesus already had faced this temptation in the wilderness at the beginning of his ministry in Matthew 4, uh, verses 8 to 10, where, say, Jesus over, overcame the temptation from the devil that, where he was offered, say, the kingdoms of the world, where 
It reads here that, Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. But Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan. For it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Or even amidst, say, the devil's efforts, uh, Jesus, see, at the beginning of his ministry, we see that he's not overcome by this temptation. Um, that his heart is not to rule over these worldly kingdoms, but he's come for another purpose. And later, as we see, when his life is on trial, now at the end of his ministry, the three-year kind of period, when he's kind of acknowledging, he acknowledges before Pilate during that trial, that where it reads in um, John 18:36, Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by, Jewish, by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. So we see that he answers Pilate, uh, but Jesus, as he answers Pilate, Jesus' kingdom is not the same as the one that Pilate is part of. It's not maintained, say, like the Roman Empire with as many legions of troops. Like Jesus' kingdom is not the same as the one the crowd is expecting, just as he acknowledges to Pilate. Like he's, he's come for another purpose and for another kingdom. And when we look at, say, what Jesus accomplishes through his victory over the cross, uh, his purpose is made clear as his kingdom is of heaven and the victory that he accomplishes through that, this is far more than the victory that the crowd wanted him to achieve in that moment. Which, say, Jesus makes clear following his death resurrection the purpose of this and, and it gives the great commission to the early church in Matthew 28, 18 to 20 where it reads that, that Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you and surely I am with you to the end of the age. Where I say, as Jesus gives the disciples this commission at the beginning when the church is being formed, um, we can know that this is why Jesus came down to earth and why he did what he did and went through the pain and suffering on the cross. I say his victory over death is why he came over to the world to redeem humanity. Um, which, on that with John 3.16, of course, it's, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, say, but have eternal life. That whoever believes in him, I say, not just the Israelites, and even, say, reminded for us today, like, it's not just those sitting here in the church today, like those, say, sitting maybe in a cafe downtown right now, or those driving, say, past our church, maybe on their way to on a camping trip, that if they just start to turn to him and believe in who he is, they will also have everlasting life. Because we always know and trust that he is our good shepherd that will say, always, he will leave the 99 to find the one, the one who will never be too far gone and the one who will never not be loved and sought after by Jesus to come home. He came not just for the perfect people, but he came for the broken and the downtrodden and those who have made many mistakes. And it's just the same as those who say, seem to have it all together as we're equally in need of his grace and forgiveness and in need of his love. So overall, as we kind of walk through uh, this event um, recorded by John this morning, like, uh, what can take away is that even though, say, even when we don't see the answer or what we feel, we're just left uncertain about how the need in life will somehow be met. We can trust that God always he has the plan. And we can hold on to our faith that despite the circumstances facing us today, God is right there with us. And what we do have to offer, this is more than enough for God. It's more than, maybe say that is ability to teach, that maybe that is ability to build or to paint or whatever your gift is. Or maybe it's, but maybe they'll say, just as the boy gave what he had, what we have to, is more than enough for Jesus. Even to say sometimes when it's not something we're as drawn in and uh, the things we feel like we lack in. Just to say, as we looked at Moses very briefly, like he had a lot of things going for him that he felt lacking what he could offer God, but God still used him despite all of those flaws and those shortcomings that he saw in himself. And to mention again, like, say Jesus could have performed the miracle, say, without their help, but he chose to use what the boy gave and distribute the food to the disciples so they would bring it to the people that they would be the hands and feet of what he has miraculously provided. And at the end, say, we looked at how. See, the crowd misunderstood that the kingdom that Jesus had come for. 
knowing that Jesus has come for all humanity, not just this select group of perfect people, but for the broken and flawed people who are, say, in desperate need of a Savior to bring hope and to transform their lives. So God, I, I pray that, say, we remember this, these truths, that I know for many this is a very familiar story and we've gone through it and we know it, God, but I pray that we do remember this, that, say, when we don't know, like you're just the same as when we do feel like we know the answers, God, I do pray that when we don't know, we do lean into you, we do turn to you, God, and, and find strength in what you can do, not what we can do. And, and with that truth, like, God, that we've been working with as well, God, that, say, what we have to offer is more than enough for you. We've given us what we need to do the test you will set before us. And so I pray that we don't say, cut ourselves short and we don't say not do something because we don't feel like we're enough or we don't feel like we can give enough, God. I do pray that we just learn just to trust you and to walk with you through these things, God. And as you say, you've come for all humanity. There's many that are needing to find hope in you. There's many that are needing to find love in you, God. So I just pray that in the gifts you've given us and the things, the opportunities that come up, God, that we would just take out that step in faith and that we would uh, be a light in the world around us, God. And I do pray, though, God, as we move to our time, say, with communion and in leading of just reflecting on what you did and what you came down on earth to do and well, the significance of that, God, I just pray you'd use that moment, too, and in a close of our service, God. And, but thank you for this morning. Your name, amen.